so. Good morning, everybody. This is Rudy coming as you live from Palm Beach in Florida, and I have with me a special guest, and his name is Alex Langer. And uh, Alex, I believe you're in Vancouver. I am. Hi, Rudy. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Alex is the uh, CEO, President, and Director of Sierra Madre, which is a um, mining company that uh, he can tell you a lot better about than what I can. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I am going to uh, put a, little, a few screen grabs on, on the screen, Alex, so that we can kind of use it as a backdrop uh, okay. as you chat. Uh, firstly, this is just my little disclaimer here because uh, I'm not trying to get other people to, uh, you know, part with all their money. That's your <laughs> uh, but no, absolutely, um, yeah, good. for sure. Uh, anyone who's watching this, do your own uh, due diligence and and research. And uh, if needs be, you can always reach out to people like Alex uh, via his website if you want more information. Uh, but what we want to do is talk about Sierra Madre. Um, so, uh, Alex, maybe. To kick us off with, just give us sort of a, a 50,000 foot overview of who you are and where you came from. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you again, Rudy. Uh, my name is Alex Langer and I'm CEO of Sierra Madre Gold and Silver. Uh, Sierra Madre Gold and Silver is a development company focused on the restart. Uh, you can see the photo there of the fully permitted La Guitarra Silver and Gold Mine, which is located about two hours just outside of Mexico City. Uh, we acquired the mine from First Majestic about a year and a bit ago. Uh, it took about a year to close the transaction, so we've been active there since March, but we paid 35 million US dollars for the mine, all in stock. Um, it was shut down in 2018, and we've been actively pushing forward uh, towards a, a restart. So uh, it's quite exciting. So we're talking specifically about uh, La Guitarra, and uh, there's an amusing backstory here because you can tell us why it's called uh, La Guitarra. But, um, uh, you know, you, you have um, three permitted sites. Uh, so uh, let's kind of uh, sort of quickly get the wrap on that one. Sure, absolutely. So the the Lagatara Silver and Gold Mine, uh, as as you mentioned, our recent acquisition, um, we just came out with an updated NI forty three one hundred one resource report uh, at Lagatara. We pretty much tripled the amount of reserves and resources that were there. Uh, previously, it was about seventeen point seven million ounces, and now we have a combined that's measured, indicated, and inferred of a forty seven million ounces. So really extended the mine life. Uh, historically, uh, the mine was producing uh, anywhere between a million to one and a half million ounces of silver a year so if you take that into account you know 47 million ounces of silver that's a very very long potential mine life uh, so what we're looking at uh, quite rapidly is increasing that production once we're in production um, so we've announced in the market that we're expecting to be in commercial production in January of 2025 if capital is available and all goes well uh, but things have gone extraordinarily well at site so there is an opportunity to actually uh, start producing material um, you know probably in the second half of 2024 so really really quite soon within seven eight months which is quite exciting uh one thing we did notice obviously with the increase in the size of the resource is that we're going to need to increase capacity so the mine itself is rated for about 500 tons per day and we are looking to increase that once we're in production to get up to a thousand and then again if all goes well up to 1500 tons per day so really increasing the amount of throughput of mill uh through the uh machines um which would be great because it also increases the amount of silver and gold we'll be processing on an annual basis so it, it it is a relatively small mine at 500 tons per day, but once you start to add it to you know 1,000 tons or 1,500 tons, it starts to become a, a really neat mid-tier producer. So that's kind of the plan uh, over the next few years here. So Alex, um, when you say, oh, you know, sort of judging by the company's name, is Sierra Madre Gold and Silver, right? So when you when you look at a particular property, in this case the mine at La Guitarra, uh, what, what what are the splits? How much is silver? How much is gold? Good question. Yeah, the, in today's value, it's about 65-35. So 65% of the value comes from silver and about 35% comes from gold. And it just depends on the current valuation of silver and gold. It's probably actually closer to uh, 68-32 right now, uh, but it, it comes and goes from, from either side. Uh, historically, it used to be even more silver, you know, just above 70%, just depending on the price of silver. So what's great about that is we do have exposure to both commodities. Uh, what I really do like about silver, it's not not just a store of value similar to gold, but it's also used in a lot of new processes moving forward. Uh, the biggest expanding use of silver right now is uh, in solar panels. Uh, they're saying a five times increase from now until 2030 in the amount of silver needed uh, for solar panels. So it's going to take up about 20% of all silver mined in the world. It will go straight to solar panels. And that number is only increasing. 
Well, that's uh, very useful information for uh, for the majority of people in uh, in our community channel here because uh, I don't want to speak for everyone, but I'd say the majority of us are kind of fossil fuel junkies, you know, so uh, we invest in oil and gas and natural gas and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and of course, uh, things like uranium. So your uh, introduction to the uh, most of the members of my audience uh, is relatively new from a commodities point of view. Sure. Except, of course, uh, many of the people who, uh, who are invested in those fossil fuels, sort of the uh, traditional commodity type investments there, also have investments in various mining companies too. Uh, but it's certainly for the majority of people on, on the channel, this is uh, sort of a diversion from what we usually talk about, which is oil and gas. Um, this image that I scooped here from your uh, corporate presentation shows the uh, Lagatara mine. So uh, can you maybe talk us through uh, what it is that we're looking at on this particular screen? Sure, absolutely. So this this is the, the project itself. Uh, it is one of the largest mining concessions in all of Mexico. It's actually 40,000 hectares in size. Uh, so it is absolutely massive. Uh, usually you'd find, say, a junior mining company might have one, you know, one piece of this. But to have the whole district, which we do have housing a junior, is quite rare. So again, one of the reasons we did jump at the opportunity to acquire this mine for First Majestic. Uh, I'll kind of walk you through uh, what we have here. So the current or the last operations were from the Lagatara Colosso Nazareno mine. Uh, that's in the kind of the northern western portion of the project you can see there. Uh, so yeah, that's exactly it. So that's where the last production came from. But as you can see here, there's lots of other little red dots. And those are other potential projects and historic projects as well on the mine. So not only are we interested in the Colosso Nazareno Lagatara mine, which has now a very long mine life. Um, there's the mill. Uh, it's fully permitted. Actually, the whole project is permitted as well. But outside of the production, quick to cash flow scenario that we do like, what's also really exciting for us is the expiration potential on the eastern portion of this project. So El Rincón and Mina de Agua, these mines were actually in production uh, in the 1600s, 1700s. Uh, they were some of the highest grade, largest producers of silver uh, during that time. Actually, in the El Rincón area on the bottom right here, uh, the former head grade of the mine was about 800 grams silver and about six and a half gram gold, some of the highest grades uh, I've ever seen, uh, especially for a mine, uh, which is quite neat. Now, these mines all shut down about the 1900s, so kind of the turn of the former century. Uh, reason being is they got a little deep and the, the adits and the tunnels became flooded. So it, at that time, there really wasn't much of a technology that you were able to dewater the mines, which is very simple to do now. You're just using pumps and hoses to pump the water out, uh, use a little bit of electricity. But back then, uh, there really wasn't much of an opportunity. So uh, for us, it's an incredible exploration potential, but now nothing, no work has been done since about 1900s. So eventually what we want to do is use cash flows from the Colosso Lagatara Nazareno operation and go explore uh, the other area. Uh, what's also quite interesting is First Majestic also noticed this. And what they had done is they um, acquired land use of an area uh, within that. They paid about 800,000 US dollars. So that area is, is free for us to use. We could put in a drift, we could put in an adit, we could explore, and eventually we could put in a, another mill if it made sense. So longer term, what we do want to do is generate cash cash flows and use those cash flows to explore uh, the rest of the area. Now, the mill itself, um, as I mentioned, it's in great shape. If you wanted to replicate the 500 ton per day uh, mill, you'd probably be looking somewhere between 60 to 80 million US dollars alone just for the mill and operations. We also have about 13 million US in underground mining equipment uh, that we have. Uh, beyond that, there's been quite a bit of work done. Uh, there's about 236,000 meters of drilling, which is huge. So having 236,000 meters of drilling would probably take you a number of years, probably two to three years and cost you close to 40 million US dollars. And then there's also a bunch of underground development. It's about 50 kilometers of underground tunnels here. That's one thing that people don't realize is when you are putting a mine into operation is you have to look forward at your underground development where you're going to be mining from. Uh, we have a lot of this access already built in. So usually about a third of most mining projects CapEx, which is the amount to put the project into production, comes just from underground development. So if you wanted to replicate what's being done there, it's probably another 40 to 50 million US. So if we just look at the replacement value of this, it's approximately about 200 million US dollars uh, just for the mill. That doesn't include any of the resources or the exploration potential. Hmm. Very impressive. So um, you, you mentioned First Majestic a couple of times. Uh, can yeah. you, just for the benefit of the uh, viewers, 
tell us uh, what that link is or where, where it came from or what do you Yeah, you absolutely. So for those that don't know, First Majestic is uh, one of the largest silver uh, miners in the world. Um, they are they have numerous operations. Uh, a lot of it is focused in Mexico. So this mine itself, uh, they shut it down or well, they put on care and maintenance in 2018 with the full expectation that they were going to restart the mine. At the time, silver was trading around $13. So it was making money, but it was very, very marginal. Uh, at the same time, they had some much larger operations that they started to focus on. So this mine was just kind of sitting there. Uh, they had always planned to reopen the mine. And honestly, uh, fortunately for us, uh, a bit of a history behind Lagatar itself is my chief operating officer, Greg Liller, uh, who's an exploration geologist, but he's ran and operated numerous mines actually modernized this facility originally. So he knows Lagatar inside and out, as well as our chief geologist, Louis Science, who helped uh, with production at the mine. So this mine, they eventually sold to First Majestic and then reacquired it. So I think the story of understanding what we want to do with the mine technically, thanks to Greg and his team, really gave First Majestic a level of comfort that we're going to push this project forward. Uh, what's also interesting with that is First Majestic really likes this mine still. And rather than taking cash for the mine, they wanted shares. So with that, uh, I'm sure We'll get to it later. They are by far our largest shareholder. They own about 47% of the company. And it, it's really due to the mine. And, and they see the opportunity here at the mine moving forward and you know, benefiting from that by having uh, my technical team push it forward. Okay. So you you touched briefly on uh, the timeline uh earlier. Uh yeah. so you can add to that if you wish, but also maybe uh just walk us through that fast track restart strategy that I have talked yeah. about. Absolutely. So uh, the step one for us was that resource report. Uh, again, historically, there's about 17 million ounces of silver and now we're oh, well over 47 million ounces. And again, that's just a start. Uh, and that's a long uh, life uh, potential now. Uh, but we had promised to come out with that report and the end of this year. And we came out a couple months early, uh, which was great. So we've been meeting and beating our expectations, which is great. It's always really important to kind of under promise and over deliver. And we hope to do the same uh, with the restart of the plan. Now, the next major, major catalyst uh, for us is going to be um, our mine research study. Uh, what's really the base of the mine research study is going to be our mine plan. So developing a mine plan is one of the most important things that we can do. Uh, whenever you start a mine or restart a mine, uh, you never want to stop production. The market absolutely hates that and, and uh, your share price would reflect that. So what we want to do is gradually be increasing production. We really want to understand where we're mining from from all times. You never want to fall behind on production. So when I say if all goes well and capital is available to us, uh, we could be processing material uh, by the second half of next year, moving towards commercial production in January of 2025 and then scaling up. So we'll start at around 300, 350 tons per day, move that up to about 500 tons per day, 750 tons per day, then 1,000. And then again, if things are going well, 1,300 and then top it out about 1,500 tons per day. Again, uh, this mine was producing about a million, a million and a half ounces of 500 tons per day. So if we're able to triple that number, uh, it starts to become quite, quite exciting. So that mine restart plan will be due kind of end of quarter one, beginning of quarter two of next year. And that's going to be very important. Again, you never want to stop production once you start. So you want to make sure your underground is ready to go. Uh, you have enough material that you're always increasing your production rather than you know stagnating or ever dropping that amount. So that's really the next big, big catalyst going to be a mine restart plan beyond equipment procurement repair mill upgrades those are all ongoing uh, we're getting actually very very close with a lot of that i do expect some announcements from us on some new equipment that we're acquiring uh, and i guess the next major feature that we should touch on is the amount of capital we're going to need so we need exactly 5.2 million us um, to get back into uh, commercial repair production. That's beyond the 5 million we have in hand right now. Now the 5.2 million uh, is kind of broken down into a few things. One is 1.3 million for underground development. Again, we really want to understand where we're going to be mining from uh, at all points. So we have a million that's also going to be used to upgrade the mill. And the mill is in great shape, but we do need to replace some hoses and, and sandblast uh, some of the areas, uh, redo some of the conveyor belts and things like that. So again, it's only about a million dollars. And then we also need about a million US um, for an 
additional few machines for the underground mining. So again, that 5.2 million US number is very, very low. Um, we expect to be able to do that uh, through perhaps an offtake agreement or a royalty or even traditional debt. So we have a number of groups right now that are, are quite interested in the offtake royalty or, or debt component. And we're just working through that right now. If all goes well, uh, we hope to have our full financing package uh, kind of completed by the end of January. And if we're able to do that by the end of January, we should be able to increase those timelines that I showed earlier with uh, you know small scale, the starting production sometime in the second half, early second half of next year. Now, if you go back one slide, I can walk through uh, the, uh, the cap table as well. Perfect. So uh, as I mentioned, we have about 5 million Canadian on a hand. Now we're spending about a million a month. So we're not slowing things down. Uh, I get updates from the mine every week. Uh, we have you know, the underground mining fleet can be completely repaired. Uh, we're pushing forward. We have the, the water treatment center. So everything's going really, really well, uh, but we are spending money. So that's why it is going to be imperative for us to bring in uh, that capital by the end of January. And again, at, at current share prices, it's not something we want to issue equity at these prices. Uh, so we're not going to. Uh, we're going to be looking at debt off take um, uh, perhaps a royalty now it all it, it is all dilution uh, which we handle it so uh, we'll make the decision that's the best for for the shareholders uh, in terms of the sh shareholders obviously first majestic is by far the largest at 47.7 percent uh, they've been incredibly supportive uh, they really do like this mine and, and they've been you know great partners moving forward uh, management and founders uh, we're actually well over 21 percent now i think we're pushing closer to 25 if you look at the insider buying, we've been very, very, very active. Uh, I think if you look at myself uh, over the last few months, I've purchased over a million shares in the market, um, even some at 65 cents, uh, quite a bit at 65 cents, almost $750,000 worth. Uh, so outside of First Majestic, I am the second largest shareholder, uh, Greg and management as well. So we've been increasing that position. Uh, institutional, um, one thing we did on the back of the acquisition of La Guitarra is raise 10 million Canadian at 65 cents. Um, about 8 million of that money uh, came from institutions, a million from management, and about a, a million from high net worth people. So the institutional number went from about 3 to 4% up to well over 11%, which is great. It kind of adds the validity of the acquisition. Uh, beyond that, we've just uh, had two analysts started to cover us, uh, both Beacon Securities and VSA. Uh, Beacon came in with a target uh, share price of 75 cents Canadian per share, and VSA came in at uh, a share price of 90 cents per share. So again, a pretty big delta. We're currently trading around 38 cents. And again, the last financing was done at 65 cents uh, in May of 2023. So not too long ago. Uh, we don't have any warrants outstanding, uh, which is also really important in the caps table. So there's really, uh, it limits the upside sometimes if you have a lot of warrants outstanding. Uh, so we don't have that. So when the stock's ready to turn, if the markets do get better, uh, we can see an appreciation relatively quickly because there is no overhang. All right. That was uh, a quick... Uh overview of, of the entire cap table. That's great. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> a, a related question, Alex, would yeah. be, you got uh, five and a half million options here. Yes. Are they, are they uh, traditional stock options? They're just stock options and those are just for employees. Uh, they're all at 74 cents as well. So again, it is a much higher strike price than, than what we have right now. And that's just uh, you know, people that are working in the mine. I have some, but everyone within the company, uh, those are just regular employee options. Is the strike price uh, consistent throughout or is it- Every single one is at 74 cents. cents. Okay, yeah. so that's an important point, right? Because right it now, is, yeah. this, this is the OTC screenshot. Yeah. Uh, the ticker symbol SMDRF. Correct. Um, but, uh, you know, even if you convert this to, uh, to Canadian, it's what, uh, 35 cents or something? Yeah, exactly. So I think this is a great thing to show. So we actually just received our OTC QX listing and our DTC eligibility recently. I think it was about six, seven weeks ago. And so we hadn't really been trading at all, uh, but uh, we went through a, a quick little road trip through the US last week and actually had some really good uptake. If you look at some of the volumes here, they average a 10 day volume over 70,000 shares per day. And if you looked at the previous uh, slide, our, our float is very small. There's maybe about 30 million shares because First Majestic isn't trading, founders and management isn't trading, uh, institutions aren't trading. So it's really that retail net worth and 20% uh, of 150 million, uh, you know, is, isn't that much. So uh, I would 
peg the uh, you know free trading float to just under 30 million shares. So again, a small amount. So for us to start trading in the US uh, in, in these quantities, I think is a really good thing. We started to see our Canadian volumes increase as well, uh, which is what you want. It's all about liquidity. Uh, I think it's it's one of the most important things a company can have is liquidity. So we started to tell the story. Now that we understand you know, approximately our, our cost to get back into production, what our mining costs and everything are going to be, uh, we're very comfortable to go out there and start telling the story. So uh, in addition to the fact that the current price of the equity is trading at about uh, sort of, you know, half of the options strike price. Yeah. Uh, on, the, on the bottom left here, you can also see the 52 range for the uh, OTC ticker, 21 cents to 36 cents. So it's just left of center. So, uh, you know, just for, I, I wouldn't suggest anyone gets into this uh, to, to day trade it unless they're just feeling lucky or they want to gamble. But uh, certainly for people who have... Uh, a longer term view on an investment, this would be uh, sort of uh, something that could be very worthwhile over the next few years or so as as a, uh, let's say, medium term investment. Um, yeah. So pretty good price. The, um, the, the, the sort of conversation kind of wraps up for me here, but uh, this is your, your moment to, uh, to, you know, sort of make the final uh, closing statement if you want to uh, get anyone uh, really excited about Sierra Madre. Sure, absolutely. Thanks again, Rudy. No, uh, you know, we're really excited with what we have. It is pretty rare for a junior of our size to have such an incredible opportunity. Honestly, I think the other issue I kind of skipped over, but it is so important is that this is fully permitted. Um, right now, permitting around the world can be very difficult, especially on the mining side. Uh, Mexico is also very difficult, even though it's a huge part of the economy down there. So it's one thing we did notice a few years ago is governmental change uh, was happening kind of across Latin America. Uh, so for us to be able to acquire a mine of this state fully permitted uh, with incredible infrastructure is a is really rare. And I truly believe we have the right technical team to push this forward. Uh, the minimal capital costs are important. Again, we're not out there raising $100, $150 million. We're, we're looking for five US, which is a relatively small amount. It, it's less than 10% of our uh, our market cap, which is great. So uh, we feel quite confident we'll be able to raise a capital uh, by the end of January. Um, and I think that's really another major catalyst. Once you have that, then there's really, you know, it's obviously risk, it's mining, don't get me wrong, and what may go wrong. Uh, uh, quite possibly will, but we do have a big contingency built into that number of, of about 20%. Uh, but I, I truly feel we'll be able to execute on our plan and, and start producing next year. And who's no, who knows what happens with the price of silver and the price of gold? You know, it's had a really incredible run. I remember when we were doing the due diligence on La Guitarra, silver was around 18 bucks, and we were thrilled. Like, well, this is going to be great. Today at 23, 24, we are absolutely delighted. So that's one of the reasons why we're pushing production so quickly. So yeah, um, again, anybody, uh, symbol is SM in Canada, SMDRF on the US. Uh, any questions, please feel free to reach out. And yeah, uh, thank you again, Rudy, for your time. This was uh, a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for taking the time to join me and to educate us a little bit about not only Sierra Madre, but just silver in general, right? So uh, I appreciate it a lot. So uh, thanks, Alex. Good Wonderful. Talk. Thanks, Rudy.